Hey everybody, welcome back to the 21st episode of Open Source for Business, brought to you by Open Teams. My name is Henry Badgery, and today I talked with Jeffrey Barek, who's the Worldwide Program Director for Open Technology and Developer Advocacy at IBM. Jeff has worked in open source for the past 20 years and is currently the head of IBM's Open Source Program Office. Needless to say, he has seen firsthand how open source has evolved over the past 20 years. And in this episode, he covers the four waves of evolution and also talks about open source business models and how IBM is monetizing open source software today. Whether you are a user, developer, manager, or just curious about the industry, Open Teams is the place to find the information, news, training, and support you need to thrive with open source software. Now that the introductions are out of the way, let's get into it. Jeff, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Hey, happy to be here, Henry. So you've been at IBM for the past 24 years, and I'd say you definitely qualify as a true IBMer through and through. But before joining IBM, you ran a startup that was acquired by AT&T. So can you talk a bit about your journey from this point through to today? Sure. Well, um, again, my background's in uh, engineering, and then I went back and got a, um, an MBA business degree because I've always sort of liked to have that balance of focusing on the technical, but also, you know, what are the practical ramifications of what you're, what the business is trying to accomplish. And I worked for a, a mobile operator before coming to IBM back when part, smartphones were not nearly anything like that smart. They were actually analog devices. Um, the original cellular system was all analog. Uh, and so I had a great you know, time at that startup and um, uh, it did give me a great appreciation though for the difference between you know, people that could operate technology versus people that could build technology, right? And the company I worked for, Macaw Cellular, was a very innovative company. But most of the other communications companies back then were more what I would call Swiss watch winders, not so much Swiss watch builders. And so when the former AT&T long distance company acquired the wireless startup I worked for, um, my standing joke was that, you know, I didn't want to work for a large bureaucratic organization. So I left and went to IBM, but it was actually a great time to join IBM because IBM was then coming out of um, another struggle period that they had. And IBM's a company that's over a hundred years old and there aren't that many companies that, you know, survived that long. So it is a Definitely. testament that IBM has been able to reinvent itself, not, not just once, but several times. And Lou Gershner was getting things back on track. And uh, again, I had an appreciation for the fact that uh, IBM was a technology company and that it really, you know, was doing some very clever things at the time. And without going into a, a huge amount of my history, uh, the short version is that I, I've worked for, again, uh, over 24 years, but I really had sort of three different um, focus areas over that period. The great thing about a larger company is that, you know, you can kind of reinvent yourself and do something different every three to five years and, you know, work in a different part of the, the business. And I always also like to say, I've kind of been attracted to the pointy end of the spear. And, you know, what the interesting thing about that is you tend to, you end up arriving first, but sometimes you run into the immovable object. Um, and certainly trying to do early wireless data at my former employer was pretty challenging back when the infrastructure was analog. Um, but uh, at IBM, my first third was essentially working in the telecommunications industry for IBM, engaging both my former employer as well as the cable properties. And cable was emerging as a big opportunity area as well. And I did that successfully uh, for about seven years or so. And then uh, I actually, as during that time, became part of the AT&T integrated account team, you know, focused back on the large long distance company based in, you know, then the New York, New Jersey area. But when I pivoted to the second chapter of my career, it was really starting to focus more on software. 
and uh, hardware from a, not just engaging with our clients, but you know, what, how are we going to continue to grow IBM as a company? And uh, I took a, my first corporate strategy job doing cross-platform Linux strategy. So you know, what's the benefit of running Linux on the mainframe, you know, Linux on Unix machines, and of course, Linux on x86, where it all started. So that was really a great pivot for me because I, I went from not knowing IBM to kind of becoming immersed into IBM. And um, the ch another challenging thing I think about, especially in larger business companies, is that it can be so challenging to understand the larger organization that you lose sight of what's happening outside and the rest of the ecosystem. So I, um, that's when I first, again, got introduced to open source and learned a bit more about some of the really savvy things IBM did in open source in the early days. Most people recall that it was around 2000 when IBM said it was investing a billion dollars in Linux. And um, you know that was certainly a smart thing that IBM did back when most people thought Linux was sort of a college uh, students you know experiment to try and create a Unix type operating system that would run on x86 architecture. But IBM also supported the creation of the Apache Foundation. IBM actually helped write some of the bylaws and provide a healthy start to what's now become a great institution in open source, the Apache Foundation. And then lastly, IBM helped to found Eclipse, the unified software development IDE for initially focused on Java. And the reason IBM wanted to do that was that back in that era, you had Sun and BEA and WebLogic and other companies trying to create a vibrant marketplace for developers and application development around Java. And the alternative back then was, you know, Microsoft saying, hey, you know, it's, it's all from one vendor. It all works together. It's all easy. And so providing a common platform to try and unify the Java ecosystem was a smart thing. And, uh, but I started to get concerned about IBM's activities in the cloud space, right? Because if you go back and look at, you know, 2010, which seems like ancient history now, but that was when Amazon was starting to prove some traction in trying to provide public cloud as an alternative to customers using their own data center. And at that time, you know, a lot of people don't realize it, but even, you know, Balmer, when he was running Microsoft, you know, realized that, you know, public cloud was an opportunity for them as well. And the thing that made it easy for them to get engaged was that neither AWS, Amazon, nor Microsoft had sort of a legacy business to keep it occupied and defend or protect, right? And IBM's bread and butter was hey, we make hardware, so you can buy hardware from us. You, we make enterprise software, happy to provide that. And we also do all sorts of services to help you with software and hardware. And that kind of approach you know, was a very successful model for IBM for the last 20 years plus since I joined it. But it was really clear to me that when I took a role in cloud, uh, and this was again 2012, half the industry was saying cloud is all about private cloud so cloud in your data center and the you know amazon and a few others were saying no it's really going to be more about public cloud and amazon was you know a early leader but for me in 2014 it was a realization that no customers are really going to you know customers don't care about this argument between traditional vendors and amazon whether it's private or whether it's public, uh, they were gonna decide for themselves where they would land along that spectrum, right? And mix and match. And both IDC and Gartner's data showed that both public and private were both growing at double digit, you know, CAGRs, compound average growth rates. And so the debate didn't make sense because there would be, you could choose both and customers would want to choose for themselves, not be told by vendors what to do. And so therefore, I wrote a blog back in 2014 on the value of hybrid cloud, and it became the most popular piece uh, in the IBM Forbes website that year. It got over 17,000 hits. 
which was wow. a pretty big number for IBM back in that day. It's still a decent number today. But success in that cloud space got me into my current role. And what I do today for IBM is I work in open technologies, and I also run the open source program office at IBM. And it's interesting because a lot of it kind of flies under the radar. Uh, but you might be surprised to learn that you know we enable, you know, IBM currently today. Uh, has some 350,000 employees worldwide. Uh, uh, our group touches about 80,000 of those employees every year because we have uh, open source annual certification. So if you're working in open source, we want you to take this annual review to make sure that you know, you're know you dotting your I's and crossing your T's. We also do these internal webcasts similar to what we're doing here where we uh, make IBMers aware of open source projects that are happening in IBM or other things they should be aware of. And then we also, uh, I go out to the various IBM labs and engage with the people that are working there because clearly uh, open source was becoming a real force in the industry about six or seven years ago. And it was really important that IBM start to get really engaged. And the critical thing back at that point was that IBM had a good reputation, but IBM just wasn't as visible. You know, we were kind of, again, flying under the radar. But for example, if I told you that two years ago, we cleared over 400,000 open source packages as part of a review process to wow. build open source as part of our offerings, that sounds like a great number. Well, that was 20... Uh, 19 and 2020, we cleared over 512,000 open source packages. Wow. So we, we both um, consume and contribute back to open source in a, a balanced way to try and ensure that, you know, IBM is not just uh, helping to take advantage of the innovation that's happening out in open source, but to effectively contribute back to make sure that we're, we, we want to be good members of the communities in which we work, right? Definitely. And I think IBM was probably one of the first to be willing to contribute to a lot of these communities because they saw the value in it. I and mean, that's kind of the enterprise open source strategy approach that I think a lot of companies are taking today. But it's been really interesting to hear you've, you've definitely been at the forefront of this evolving landscape, which is open source. And so I'm curious to know, in the past 20 years, how have you seen open source evolve? Well, it's really been interesting. I, I typically look at what I call the four waves of open source. And the first wave was all about individuals and whether it was a software developer or an entrepreneur, somebody who saw the potential of open source, a lot of it in the early days was just individuals and a lot of passion around convictions of what was right. You know, some people viewed it as almost like a religious thing of a kind that, mm -hmm. you know, software should be free and other people had a more pragmatic, well, you know, there's a role for free software, but, you know, there's also a role for companies to find ways to make money off software, right? And uh, famously, Bill Gates, you know, back in the 70s, wrote this note to the industry saying, paraphrasing, you know, stop passing around free software or none of us are ever going to make a you know, living in this industry, right? But, you know, sharing software has been happening as long as there have been computers. And the second wave of open source was when companies like IBM took notice. And I mentioned back in 2000, we supported Linux, um, but it wasn't just IBM. There were other companies like HP and others that saw the value of, of the potential. And you could almost think of early open source was sort of like doing fundamental research in university, right? It's like, you know, you don't want to just do your own research. You want to publish papers and share your knowledge and build the common knowledge base of the area that you're, you know, working in. And so, you know, that era lasted for about another, you know, seven or eight plus years. And then suddenly this third wave of impact started to happen, essentially the emergence of hyperscale players. So some people call them FANG, but it's like, you know, Facebook. Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, all of these, you know, but there are more Twitter is another example. Uh, eBay, eBay is another early example. All of these companies started to build their platforms with conventional enterprise software, 
but the real opportunity to, to be a game changer was to leverage open source software to build a massive platform affordably. The interesting thing is all of those hyperscalers used open source to grow, but they all had different approaches to whether they would contribute back or not. You know, Apple was an example of somebody who was very reluctant to contribute back early on. It just wasn't in Steve's job's culture to be a sharing, caring kind of guy, right? It's like, yeah. sure, you, it's basically, you want to give me free software, I'll take it, but expect something from me, you know, forget that. Again, I mentioned IBM. IBM was, was the senior leadership back then was very savvy about open source and realized that you know, if IBM just showed up in these young open source communities and said, hey, we're the 800 pound gorilla, you know, and here's how it's going to work, all those people would walk away. And, you know, that's one of the great things about open source, right, is that individuals have freedom of action, just like, you know, companies do. And so that's a reason that IBM always has tried to be a, a, a balanced consumer and contributor. But after the hyperscaler phase, we're into this now fourth wave of impact, and that's that traditional enterprise companies, companies like IBM's customers, are starting to change the way they consume open source software. They're still going to have these subscription support relationships uh, with you know, Red, uh, you know, Red Hat or SUSE or Canonical or Ubuntu, you know, all the other recent startups, because you know, that's one of the key things that some people don't really understand about open source in the enterprise is that say you're MongoDB and you put this open source database out there and you're getting all of these folks, you know, downloading copies of it and you're going, great. Uh, how do I, you know, how do I tell of all these thousands of people that are using it, who can I actually sell something to? And, you know, some people would say, oh, it's the big companies. You can sell to big companies and, or, you know, oh, it's the financial sector. You should sell to the financial sector. But those are both wrong answers. The, yeah. the, the people that will actually give you money are the people that are using your technology to build mission critical apps. Because if you have a mission crit critical app that incorporates open source software, you want someone to pick up the phone when things go wrong. That has influenced uh, the direction that enterprises are taking. So they, they will still have that relationship, but now they're seeing the value of putting some of their own software developers directly into open source projects that they feel are significant to them. And a great example of that in the US marketplace is a financial company called Capital One. They started innovating over 10 years ago. They they decided that they needed to sort of have you know a research group. You know, why would a bank need a research group? But they knew that you know technology had potential. Uh, they actually started their own open source program office five or six years ago. And they're now uh, also, they've joined uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as part of the end user community. And they have some of their people participating, again, not everywhere because you know resources are not limited, but selectively, they're just one example of what I believe will happen with pretty much any significant sized enterprise company in the next five years, we'll have their own open source program office because it's just becoming that important to their business infrastructure. And I kind of see the OSPO or open source program office as the heart of open source within the company. I think that it's definitely very important to have that central point for people to come to and ask the questions, particularly because there's so many around compliance, security, and everything related to open source. And the way that you describe the four waves of open source, I thought it that you had a very similar perspective to Meki McCauley when it comes to describing those different waves. And Meki was actually a guest on the podcast. He also works at IBM, funnily enough. But if I recall correctly, Meki explained the evolution of open source in three waves rather than four. And he explained that the first wave involved individuals who wanted to scratch their own itches, like you said. And it turns out that they obviously saw the merit in reusing the code that others use. And they also understood the benefits of sharing it and building upon it to become experts themselves down the track. Then in the second wave, he was saying that people recognized that they had all of these collective libraries, but they didn't have a way to build upon them. So uh, they ended up providing the value in the form of services. And then the shift from product to service meant that everything became as a service. And at this time, companies knew that they had an itch, 
but they didn't necessarily want to scratch it themselves. And instead, they wanted others to scratch it for them. Um, he then defined the third wave as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, um, the enterprise open source strategy phase, which I think you definitely, definitely hinted at in, in your fourth wave. And that's happening now because companies are finally coming to terms with the fact that open source isn't just in IT, it's in every area of the business. Well, uh, I, I think that's true. I think it's also interesting that some people look at what's happening in open source today and you know, some of them basically are saying, wow, this is kind of concerning, you know, because, you know, it was Mark Andreessen that famously said, you know, some time ago that software was eating the world, right? Yeah. And then some people observed about 10 years ago that open source is kind of eating enterprise software. And if you think about it, you know, give me a name of a new enterprise software company that's emerged in the last decade. You know, there really isn't. Uh, anything that comes top of mind in any significant fashion. And so in this world where everything's becoming as a service, will open source thrive? Because one of the other challenges that has been a hot topic in open source for some time now is how do we make it sustainable? You know, there are some people that have tried to come up with some of these innovative models where, you know, you can be an open source coder and you can kind of get sponsorship, right? Or something like that. Or you can become an open source coder and kind of do piecework. And it doesn't always necessarily provide a robust, comfortable standard of living if you're kind of doing work hand to mouth like that. But companies like IBM, you know, they support their developers doing work in open source because it fits into this bigger picture, right? So, you know, some people have said, well, gee, maybe in the future only cloud companies or major tech companies will contribute to open source because there's really no opportunity for individual developers. And I think the enterprise angle is the solution to that concern because it's not just the big tech companies it's now mid-size and even startup companies right there's a very innovative company out of ireland called nearform that emerged out of the uh, vibrant activity around the javascript community and they have created uh, a model in which they can engage with clients help them quickly leverage the power of javascript to provide rapid you know, application development change in their organization and uh, do that in such a way that it works for near form, it works for their clients, and it helps support the uh, open community around JavaScript. I think the other uh, interesting question is, you know, what's next? You know, is there a fifth wave? And uh, I think part of that fifth wave is going to be the influence of open source in industry verticals, because one of the things that open source has been quite successful with is, is it's basically, uh, some people like to call it the plumbing, right? It's the common infrastructure. Does the world need 12 operating systems? You know, it's always a very interesting question, but as open source has kind of moved up the stack, there now seems to be this opportunity for other industries to innovate. One example of this is, you know, the Linux Foundation has uh, supported the creation of a a sub foundation called the LF Energy, and it's principally focused at the electrical industry. And you know, well, why would they use or how would they use open source? And if you think about it, just like you hear people talking about in IT, you know, software fabric or you know, network as a service, the ability of a utility to move away from the old model, because if you think about you know, electrical infrastructure you know, how do you buy from certain vendors and yet have interoperability of the electrical grid? And how do you get away from the very expensive proprietary electrical grid infrastructure and try and move towards something that's a bit more affordable and a bit more flexible, right? And if we're going to, as a society, make this big pivot from fossil fuels to a more renewable electrical future, certainly there seems to be an opportunity for open source software to provide a substantial layer of that infrastructure that can be effectively shared across uh, members in that industry vertical. So utility is just one example, uh, certainly open source in healthcare is another example, right? And one of the things that happened out of the COVID situation was that company I mentioned earlier, Nearform, was able to work uh, to quickly develop a, a contact tracing app 
by collaborating with Apple and with Google around the Android operating system and come up with a way that phones could be aware of other phones around that and yet still maintain the privacy of the individuals. It's that kind of rapid innovation that I think will start to impact other industry verticals. So there's there's my call for the fifth phase. That's exciting. And it's definitely in line with something that a previous guest on the podcast, Carl Eric Moles, he is working at Debrict, was previously the head of open source at Sony. We have a whole episode on open source in the automotive industry. And he was having a conversation with the head of a large truck company in Europe. And they were saying that in the next five years, they don't think that the development around open source in the automotive industry will be much different to what it is today. But within 10 years, he sees it significant impact on open source, particularly from the automotive industry, which is exciting. But I'd now like to shift gears and focus on open source business models. So can you touch on this co- concept and explain how IBM is monetizing open source technologies today? Sure. It's funny because um, uh, in the before times when we still went to conferences, uh, I would collaborate with a colleague of mine, Stephen Wally, and we'd actually do a bit of a debate on the topic because he had created this you know, very thoughtful pitch on why there was no open source business model. And I suggested to him three or four years ago now that, hey, why don't we do a sort of a next generation of your thoughts here and do it as a debate? And you can take that position that there isn't one, and I'll take the position that there is. And so we've done that uh, and had a fun time doing it. The developers in the crowd always seem to kind of enjoy the give and take of it. But the net of it is, is that he argues that open source is really a distribution method and a highly efficient way to create software at scale. Because again, this concept of reuse, this concept of you know collaborative software development and giving you the opportunity to rapidly share because of the nature of open source and the licenses and being, certainly you have to pay attention to whether the license you use is a bit more permissive or whether it's restrictive, but he looks at it from that engineering perspective. And I totally, you know, respect that point of view, but I also think it's missing something if you just say, well, there is no open source business model because you know, look at Firefox, for example, you know, they, they survive in part on ad revenue, right? And so, you know, that's, that's their model. And, you know, look at, look at GitHub, right? I mean, people were shocked in the industry because GitHub, you know, became sort of the most dominant repository for open source software. And you you probably know this, some of your uh, audience may not, but GitHub was based on Git. Mm-hmm. Git was developed by Linus to help him deal with you know, the complexity of the Linux kernel development. And GitHub was one of the few companies that took the open source Git software and said, we're going to put this you know, user-friendly UI wrapper around it and other value add. And that was their model. And so GitHub got to a certain size where Again, they were the the half of the software created in open source lived on lives on GitHub, but the ability to monetize that was underperforming VC expectations. Mm-hmm. And there were rumors in the industry that, oh my gosh, you know, what happens if they flame out? What happens if they don't get to a sustainable business model and they turn the lights off? Right? That would you know, would have been tragic. And so lo and behold, people were very surprised when suddenly the news broke that huzzah, Microsoft is buying GitHub and and not just buying it, but buying it for $7 billion. And incredible. Yeah. I joked to Steve, hey, that sounds like a pretty good business model to me. (laughs) Wish I'd thought of that. And and it was uh, it was less than a year later that IBM announced that they were buying Red Hat. And if $7 billion sounded expensive, $34 $34 billion is quite a bit of money as well, but it's just a validation of the fact that open source is here to stay, that some people will look at some of the warning signs and predict the sky is falling, but somehow open source continues to sort of evolve and survive and that it's going to continue to have significant impact in vertical industries, uh, as well as, you know, it's changing fundamentally a lot of things that are happening in intellectual property and in research and uh, other things. 
Definitely. And one interesting thing that Amanda Brock said on the podcast uh, was open source is like gravity. It's here to stay. You've got to accept that it's here and move on knowing that it is here to stay. So I think that definitely does resonate with some things I've heard in the past. But that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for your time, Jeff. It's been amazing chatting to you, getting to know you, uh, and also just learning so many things in this podcast and on a previous call we had. So thank you. Henry, it's been my pleasure. Um, wish you uh, continued success and look forward. We'll have to chat again sometime in the not too distant future. Definitely. I would love to. And for everyone who's listening, thank you for listening. If you're watching this, thanks for watching. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, then please leave a like and comment letting us know what you think. Uh, also subscribe to see more content like this and do the same on Apple Podcasts or Spotify uh, just to really stay up to date with the latest news in open source. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Until next time. Thanks, y'all.